The Outdoor Show. It's the program that puts you into the peaceful and beautiful home of Mother Nature. It moves you back to that calm fishing pond up north, one step away from Lake Michigan, or into your hunting blind on a brisk fall morning. The Outdoor Show. It's a peaceful program. This is not your mother's outdoor show. This is the WHTC Outdoor Show, hosted by a guy who literally has hunting in his name. Tom Mettendorp is Dutch for Village in the Maiden, or King's Hunting Ground. Your co-host, sometimes, is Tim Becker of Powderhorn Guns and Archery. It's time for what really happens when the guys go up north on that hunting trip. It's time for the WHTC Outdoor Show, presented by My Firearms ETS. That's M-I Firearms ETS on 1450 WHTC, Holland's News Leader. Good morning. Welcome to the Outdoor Show. I'm Tom Meddendorp, and my sometimes co-host Tim Becker is here again today. It's Captain Tim Becker of you Powderhorn know Guns and Archery. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> and believe it or not, yes, I, this is a good I, thing. I, I double booked. This is a good thing. I double booked. We we set this date. Oh, it was a while ago. Probably June, something like that. Back in back in June, uh, I set a date with uh, Jamie from the Outdoor Discovery Center mm-hmm. from J- with Jamie Krupka because we were trying to get uh, him in here and. Uh, you, he's got a busy schedule, and then I set the date with Terry Borman from the Farmers Co-op, and to get him in, <laughs> because we need to talk about the food plot field day, and it just so happens it worked out great because Jamie knows about uh, what animals like, and yep. and Terry knows about what how things grow and, and all that good stuff. So it worked out great, and we already have a caller on the line. Good morning, caller. How are you this morning? Okay, so Caitlin lied to me when she put her hand up like she was on the telephone. <laughs> Good morning, caller. Uh oh. Caller was there. Yeah. Sorry about that, caller. If you're still there, call back. We're having phone difficulties again. I'm wondering if you push that button harder, Caitlin. If yeah. Do it. You, use <laughs> the whole kidding. fist this time. <laughs> we're we're being hard on Caitlin. Yeah. She let she locked us out this morning. Ah, uh, she did. She did. <laughs> Anyhow, so. W- this promises to be a pretty darn good show, I would say. We've got we've got Terry Borman from the Farmers Co-op in Hudsonville, 3302 Prospect Street. I got that right, didn't I? You did. Uh, good morning. And uh, <laughs> uh, we're gonna we're gonna talk about how food plots, putting them together, growing them, and everything else. But I gotta say, did I tell you, Terry, about Earth Solutions? Earth Solutions? No, you did not. Earth Solutions is a longtime friend. I grew up with him and Matt mm-hmm. and. Uh, he does extreme brush hogging. Okay. He'll he'll come in and he'll clear lanes and stuff for people. Uh, he also does stump grinding and he'll put in driveways. You know, crushed asphalt, crushed uh, concrete, stuff like that. But the earth, grubbing, the 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 grubbing, the earth solutions. He can prep to the point where you guys have the equipment for the you know plowing and planting. Sure. He can take care of all that stuff, and that's uh, to call earth solutions. You call five six six zero three nine zero, and. Uh, you can get. Uh, you guys should set up a little partnership. You Somebody should, wants uh, to get that food plot ready, then there you go. Matt can take care we, of that. Yeah, we'll gladly post his picture. Now, do you guys put in food plots, or do you just rent the equipment? We just rent the equipment. Yeah, we don't go out into the field. Although our agronomy division would, you know, come and spray Roundup if the field's big enough, or br- bring lime down or something. like yeah, that. Yeah, and we're not talking. You're going to go out and rent the uh, big four wheel drive tractor. No. Or, uh, no. no. <laughs> no, Terry said you could just use it. <laughs> oh, whoa. Whoa, wait a minute. Back up. No, do you guys well, just. Well, of course, Terry them? said that if you cover the cost. Oh, oh. <laughs> now this just went the other way. <laughs> Is it just the pull behind ATV stuff, or do you have three point hitches for like rototillers? No, just tractors? the pull behind. Oh, it's excellent. a uh, disc and compactor combination, and yep. then we have a large uh, spreader and then a harrow rake. Nice. Yep. Nice. Yeah, so you can use your own equipment the, the pulling equipment yep. but then sure. the co-op's got everything you need to get everything rolling right and so on and so forth yep yeah perfect yes, we do excellent and then uh if we go over to jamie here we got uh did you know that there was a a certain beetle we got to watch out for yeah there's a new one isn't there yeah uh, which species are you talking about 
<laughs> yeah. I don't know. <laughs> that's 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 don't. They're, they're worried it. about it. The Michigan DNR is worried about it. It's, it's it, affecting I, a I'm different tree, read. right? Is it the Asian longhorn beetle? No. Mm. I don't think so. Well, you know what? I'll look that up. What's the one that is it the ash beetle that kills the em- ash emerald ash borer? Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's another one just like that, I guess. That's affecting maybe birch. There is another species of beetle that's affecting mature trees. That's Asian longhorn beetle, but that I'm not sure. I'm it's a I, I'm not sure where its range is at the moment, but it's certainly one of those ones on the radar that has hit Michigan. I, I believe it's in Michigan, yeah. and it's been seen. Um, I think 2012 or so is is the earliest it was seen. No, it seems to me I was up camping or doing something in the woods, and I saw signs up for them because they got that big rhino horn that comes up, right? Not oh, big. So but you know, in the we, we must be talking about a different species then, because what I'm talking about is a half inch long black beetle, white polka dots on its back, and, oh, and, and huge thinking. long antenna. So hmm. uh, I'm not sure which species you. A little critter does that much damage, huh? It's amazing. Holy cow. <laughs> Now, would they overtake the trees in, like, huge groups of them? Yeah, you'll see little clusters of where there's impact, although they can fly, so they're readily going to be able to move from, you know, tree to tree, not just necessarily decimate one food plot, yeah. or, or as I'm staring at paper here, sorry, yeah. food plot, tree plot, yep. you got a 20-acre wood. Um, it's food it's, for them, though, it, right? it is food for them. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's going to decimate a wooded area. Ugh. Crazy. So you got your, your beetles all figured out now, Tim? I don't know. <laughs> well, I know I posted I po- I reposted the Michigan Outdoor or not not the, uh, the Michigan DNR mm-hmm. uh, their post about this beetle we got to watch out for and so on. I put that to our Facebook page, uh, uh, the Outdoor Show on Facebook. So if somebody wants to check that out, because there's signs to watch for and so on. But I was just thinking, you know, if 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 you got an area that's been destroyed, like the um, the ash trees. Uh, if an emerald, emerald ash borer has gotten in there and, and then destroyed an area, to get those trees down and get that, that cleared out and make that a food plot for something else, what happens, Jamie? We, we go ahead and we make a food plot for something else. These invasive species, they'll move on for some other food source, right? Uh, potentially. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's the thing. you got to make sure there's something in the ground there, though, because if, if you lose the trees, then you're going to potentially make it available for another species to come in. Uh, reed canary grass, purple loosestrife are going to mm. be species that will come into those areas. Where ash trees live is typically a wet habitat. So you've got to find those species that would thrive in a reasonably wet habitat. And that's at purple loosestrife? Purple loosestrife, yeah. Is the stuff that you guys had a part in helping burn that's over right. here, right? That's right. Uh, well, and you guys did great. And, and there was burning for that as well as reed canary grass, that's right. which is, uh, an, uh, excuse me, not reed canary grass, but uh, phragmites, phragmites co- common yeah. reed, which can grow like 15 feet tall yeah. and take over a marsh. Yeah, yeah, we talked about that last time, didn't we? That was, that was awesome to see that happen. Yeah, people can go to whtc.com and, you know, go to media, podcast, and look up the old show yep. to see what that's all about. <laughs> yeah, that was something. <laughs> last time we had Jamie here. <laughs> yeah. So, and talking about those wet areas to get that um, prepped for food plotting, uh, Terry, uh, food plot stuff in a more wet zone. Are there specific seeds for that, or is that something, you know, because, you know, we, I live over there, you work over there, Hudsonville, mm-hmm. uh, there's a muck fields, mm-hmm. and those, that's usually pretty moist soil. Mm-hmm. It grows well, it grows, grows very well, uh, but my curiosity is there are only certain things that grow in those areas. Well, most, most seeds like a damper, wetter soil to grow in. Mm-hmm. Um, clovers like that uh, soil and that condition. So that's a very popular one, but there are other ones uh, that like a little damper area to grow in. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of the grasses uh, you'd stay away from, some you'd you know definitely thrive on there. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah, it's, uh, most, most seeds don't like hot, dry areas. Mm-hmm. They prefer something damp. There are very few, and that's a that's kind of a hard one because a lot of guys buy land that it's a sandier soil. Yeah. So then you're looking at more like an alfalfa to put in that area, whereas your other seeds are going to like the damp, damp soil. Yeah. So I know it grows. That's stuff. a difficult one. Everything because, grows well by me. Yeah. <laughs> that's a difficult one yeah. because guys 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 can pick up that 
lighter weight soil uh, fields, mm -hmm. and then they come in and yeah, I want to put a food plot in here. You know, and it's ooh, that's sand. Yeah, yeah. I've got that up north. You you till down, even if you get down past just a couple inches, it's solid sand. Yep, it's awful. Yep. So now, alfalfa usually does better in a on a lighter soil, and there are some clovers that will, but most of them prefer yeah. a heavier, damp soil. Okay, so I'm just kind of curious. The, uh, you know, you get, like Tim was just saying, you till down, you get into the sand. If you've got good, a, a bed of, you know, the leaves and everything that's fallen over the years with with a tree, uh, with a forested area, uh, and you get that acidic uh, top portion, mm -hmm. how deep should you till? Should Are you, you saying with the leaves say, say breaking got, down, making a, yeah, a say topsoil? Yeah, say I've got four inches of that topsoil that's pretty heavy and pretty acidic. Mm -hmm. Should I then till eight inches into the earth in order to mix the sand and the um, stuff? Or what should I do there? Well, the further you go down, the more weed seeds you're going to pick up and put on top. So you got to be careful. Um, usually not more than three inches down because then you start to open up new beds of weed seeds that you're going to flip up on top and you're going to have a new crop of weeds so but you, it looks so nice when you pull it up I from know, 10 yeah. inches down yep exactly <laughs> and, that, and you're starting to see some of the farming practices that same type of thing where they're not going they're not deep tilling like they used to either they're doing more surface tilling because mm -hmm. otherwise it's releasing everything and putting it back up on top I got you. We'll pick that up in a second. We got a caller on the line. Good morning, caller. How are you? Hey, Tom. It's Ron. Hey, Ron. Hey, Ron. <laughs> we hey, uh, maybe maybe I don't know if you had service issues on the lake at all or, or something. We 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 could lost you earlier. I appreciate oh, you calling okay. back. We no, uh, no problem. Yeah, we're, we're kind of interested. You know, we talked last week about the Tata tournament and we talked about the uh, uh, big red going on. Yeah. Uh, How did the Tata tournament turn out? Uh, great. We had forty eight boats in that tournament. Um, and uh, lots of uh, good fishing uh, was done yesterday. It was a little bumpy out on the lake, probably mm -hmm. two to three footers, but uh, everybody uh, had a good time, and uh, they had a record number of boats, 48 boats in that tournament. I thought I saw that uh, a posting, 48 boats. I thought, man, that's a lot more than when we first started covering this a few years back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, um, actually, um, the girls put their first tournament on in uh, 2008, and uh, they had eight boats in that tournament. Hey, and, keep and it now up to 48. That's awesome. You bet. Do you know who won it? Uh, Fishing Coles. Nice. Oh, really? Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so if you go to BigRedClassic.com, you can actually see the leaderboard. That's great. Sweet. BigRedClassic.com. Now, I got to know if we uh, – do you, do you have posted how much money was raised for uh, the awareness for cancer? Um, four thousand dollars. Nice. Wow. Yeah. That that's really awesome. Four thousand uh, dollars towards research and so on uh, yep. for the save from the save the save the Tatas tournament, which happens every year the Friday before the Big Red Classic. And the Big Red Classic now today. How many boats you got out there today? Uh, we've got a record number of boats in this as well. We have eighty-eight total boats, thirty-three pro, fifty-five ams, and. Wow. Uh, from what we understand, it's uh, now the largest uh, sport fishing tournament on Lake Michigan. And that's all because we talk about it on the outdoor show. <laughs> Absolutely. That's uh, I, I give you guys all that credit. <laughs> are you out there right now, Ron? I'm sure you are. Yeah, we're, uh, we're fishing uh, just north of Holland. We're probably just north of uh, uh, Tunnel Park mm -hmm. in about uh, 80 foot of water, something like that, 60 foot of water. Are you? And, uh, Ooh. And we have got uh, three nice kings in the boat. Uh, we wow. started off with a triple, so uh, all three downriggers went off at the same time. That's Did great. that happen right when you called us the first time? <laughs> uh, no, but we took uh, another one. Uh, we went two for three on those triples, um, and then we uh, we had another one go off uh, when I was calling you. So uh, that's why I had to call you back. Oh, see, <laughs> all you had to do was dial us, and that's that's what happens. <laughs> yeah, you've you only go. you've only been fishing for less than a half hour, haven't you? Yeah, we had we had those three on within about uh, four or five minutes of dropping the lines in. There's nothing wrong with that. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Is, so, is that is Doug back? Yeah, Doug is uh, is in the back of the boat. We're actually fishing on uh, JJ uh, the JJ this morning, uh -huh. and uh, he's a charter captain out of uh, uh, Yacht Basin Marina. Yep. And uh, so we're uh, we're fishing in the pro division, 
And uh, since we had more than 30 boats, we're fishing for $10,000 today. Nice. Wow. Well, you tell Doug that I think it's all because he's on the boat. I'm sorry, say that again? Make sure you tell Doug that I think it's all because he's on the boat. <laughs> I'll let him know. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just to recap, the money, there's money raised for the Boys and Girls Clubs of Holland uh, uh, from this tournament, right? That is correct. And the uh, uh, Water Clarity Project. Oh, the Water so Clarity we're, Project. Uh, we're okay. raising money for both of those. Nice. That is really awesome, and with that many boats, that should be a, a good paycheck uh, for helping out the Boys and Girls Clubs and the Water Clarity Project. Absolutely. We're hoping uh, to give away about uh, $12,000 total this year. That wow, is sweet. That's great. That is sweet. And you, and you remember, folks, you heard it here on the Outdoor Show. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Hey, I should get going here, and uh, but I wanted to call in and say hello, and uh, thank you guys. Uh, for your continued support of uh, of the tournament, and uh, thanks for the publicity that you give us. And uh, you guys have a great day, okay? Thank you very thank much, you. Ron. Thank we you. appreciate the update. All right, guys. Talk soon. All righty. Thank you. Yeah. Mm, bye-bye. The Outdoor Show is brought to you by Westonbrook Mower, where they service what they sell. All units are ready to use when they leave the store, and Westonbrook submits your warranty information so you don't have to. Stop into the Holland or the Jenison store, check them out on your computer at westonbrookmower.com, or call them at 616-396-5733. Lines are open. Give us a call, 395-1450. We'll be back here shortly on The Outdoor Show. Welcome back to the Outdoor Show, brought to you by Michigan Firearms, your personal protection and concealed carry specialist. We're back, ready to talk with you. Give us a call, 395-1450. Oh, well, we got a lot in already mm-hmm. in the first segment, yeah. which went a little extra long because yep. we had to, we had to wait for Ron to get those fish in the boat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's okay, because we're sitting here relaxing, having our Bigby coffee this morning. Yep. Remember, Bigby's not just a coffee shop, it's an experience. You know it. <laughs> We like our big. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Ron mentioned the uh, the fact that uh, the Big Red Classic raises money for the Boys and Girls Clubs of Holland, but then also this year they're raising money for the Water Clarity Project. I know, Jamie, you're not heading up that, uh, and Travis was... Uh, he was just at their uh, dinner last night. The, at the dinner to mm-hmm. tell them. Yep. And... But can you give us, give the listeners just a kind of an overview of sure. the work? Sure. Uh, Project Clarity is, it's a five-year plan for cleaning up and restoring Lake Makatawa and the, the watershed. And so uh, we've isolated areas that we know that need a little bit more work. Uh, and, and it's going to affect people like Ron in fishing because you're going to see uh, uh, better reproduction upriver in these, in these, in the watershed. So you're going to see a uh, a domino effect of positive if we work on things in the agricultural areas in the residential areas to clean the water that's going out into Lake Nakatawa and ultimately Lake Michigan. So this kind of ties in with the with the when you say the watershed everybody uh, not everybody but many people understand that the Nakatawa Greenway uh, there's been all the improvements and so on the Ottawa yep. County Parks has the uh, upper Nakatawa natural area right. and stuff like that which I know that's close. I like to walk there, so sure. uh, that I, I'm more familiar with that area. Uh, so this is going to tie in, and it's going to help with uh, keeping the the, the runoff. Keeping and everything the else. yeah, keeping the sediment on on the fields is certainly a big deal. We got to make sure that we keep the soil where it belongs on the fields, uh, because what happens is that phosphates and different chemicals bind with the sediment, and when that sediment washes into the river systems, that ends up downriver. That's why you see algae blooms and you know, other compounding issues. So a lot of the efforts that we're doing, like one of the big ones right now is the Hayworth Project, where we have over by Hayworth headquarters by the Tulip City, or uh, excuse me, West Michigan Regional Airport. <laughs> I, I, when I was coming back from Wisconsin, <laughs> I was coming back from Wisconsin this week, and I saw the sign for West Michigan Regional Airport, and I thought, you used to call that Tulip City. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we have a big project over there. We're actually uh, um, creating large impoundment areas so that when water overflows the river, going through that mm-hmm. area behind uh, Hayworth Corporation, when it overflows the riverbanks there, that water can settle out and return to the river channel 
after it has had sediments drop out of it. So we're creating uh, uh, wetlands and habitat there, both for wildlife as well as to uh, uh, slow down the water so there's less scouring effect, as well as remove some of those uh, deposits that happen. That's much like what they did at that upper Macatawa it, It's area, the same concept, it? yeah. It's okay. the same concept where you're, you're, you're unchannelizing because you don't want to – channelized river is going to move faster and only scour more. Yeah. So uh, you want to you want to create some natural meander to the river in addition to giving a place for the water to go. And uh, I can tell you, there's there some people are skeptics about this, but I've seen the results it's, up it's, there. It's it's a proven <laughs> thing. It's proven yeah. something. It's and it's uh, without it question it works. Yeah, it works. Yeah. And I hope that I hope that improves our fishing and stuff and yeah. everything else, uh, as it should, uh, because you know for years everybody made fun of Mekatawa. Yep. Uh, and. Um, originally it was black lake yep <laughs> and uh you know then it changed to makatawa lake but you could almost get back to i don't know mud lake brown lake <laughs> um, sediment lake <laughs> all of those are uh, are fair names for it it's always been it's a drowned river mouth so it's mm-hmm. never going to look uh like anything but a a river that has some turbidity to it but it, it's it's okay. excessive right now it's too much right right it's just yeah i mean there was the the name people gave it like uh, Mecca toilet. Yeah, oh yeah. And, and that's uh, you know, everybody thought that was because the sewer went in there. That's not where the, it, not, it, not it at wasn't all. that. Not it at was all. all the sediment from the fields that got in there made it brown and, and nasty. Sure, and yeah. There's a lots of of compounding issues in the community that contributed to the poor quality of the lake. Yes, yes, definitely. And with the improvements. Our fishing improves, yeah. and I know that'll make a lot of people happy that they're you know fishing off piers and everything else, or people that don't go to the big lake to fish and all that good stuff. Which is, you know, I think I think it's awesome. So, the um, the fact that we're, we're they're raising money from the Big Red Classic to do this, that's excellent as well. So, what we're going to do is we're going to talk more about some activities from the Outdoor Discovery Center, and we're going to talk about August fifteenth. August fifteenth. Is uh, for the food plot field day over at the farmers co- or at the Vriesland. Uh, it's the agronomy location, uh, Vriesland 64th and Byron Road. That's a great uh, landmark for people. It's 64th and Byron Road, and it's the Vriesland Country Stores right there with the gas station. But right behind that, or to the south of that, is where the agronomy location is. And Saturday, August 15th, from nine o'clock to uh, noon. noon, there's going to be vendors and other people out there uh, to help you out with uh, how to get your food plotting done. Mm -hmm. But the big thing is there's going to be food plots that have already been planted and are growing, and people will be able to check that out. Right, Terry? Right. We have a field back there that we've been working on, and we've got 10 by 10 squares, uh, 10 foot by 10 foot squares of of a variety of food plot seeds, and uh, they're growing. And so we're going to have a day where you can come down and do a walkthrough and uh, we have an agronomist there, and I'll be there and to talk. Um, unfortunately, our vendor list has gotten short. We've had excuses like brothers' weddings and stuff like that. You hey, know, these I, things happen. But when we come back, we're <laughs> going to talk about the vendors. Oh, and different I things wasn't even on. thinking about you, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Farmers Co-op Elevator in Hudsonville is your food plot headquarters with over 40 different seed varieties to choose from, providing in-house soil testing as well as fertilizers, lime, and equipment to plant, maintain, and get maximum performance out of your food plot. Visit the Farmers Co-op at 3302 Prospect Street in Hudsonville. For a complete list of products and services, check them out at, online at fcelevator.com. Lines are open. Give us a call 395-1450. We'll be back here shortly on The Outdoor Show. Welcome back to The Outdoor Show, brought to you by... Powder horn guns and archery for all your arrow knocking, gun cocking, fish hooking, flag waving, stand up and sing, God bless America hunting and fishing needs. Lines are open. Give us a call. 395-1450. We're back ready to answer your questions right here on the Outdoor Show. If we don't get the airy whistle in there, it's just not the same. <laughs> <laughs> So, I got something I real interesting blipped. real quick. Real quick, <laughs> real interesting. My wife just sent me a text from those time hop things that you can get on your phone. And it says, five years ago today, because of all the, you know, days that go back, mm-hmm. Powderhorn opened. 
Wow. Five five congratulations. Yeah. We have a round of applause. Thank or? you. Thank you. Only one. You got the applause on, Nobody the, else? on the thing there? Caitlin, come on. Where are you? Uh, come on. What oh, kind of producer yay. are you? There we go. There we go. Mine's always better. So I thought that was pretty neat. Yeah. Five was years. it five years ago? Today. Yep. Nice. Awesome. Nice. Yep. And was it a Saturday in August or was it? No, I don't remember. I. Five years is a long time, yeah. I understand. I think it was a... I wouldn't know. You had a soft opening <laughs> earlier in the week and worked up to the grand yeah. opening on Saturday. Yeah, where the Let's fireworks went off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> da, 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 da. I believe, well, not based on the actual date, but based on the day of the, uh, mm-hmm. the first Saturday of August, it was 2007, eight years ago, that we started the outdoor show. There you go. Yeah, you... Eight years or nine? I thought you said you this just is, completed This is the eight. first show of the ninth, ninth year. Season. We completed okay. eight years Yeah. Uh, last week. That means it's October will be five. I've been on here with you. Yeah, because it was that first, first time, year. though. First year. Part <laughs> Very part. So really, it comes back to about a year and a half. Oh, that is funny. Thanks, Terry. Appreciate that. Do what I can for you, Tim. <laughs> oh, well, on that note, let's talk about this food plot. Yeah, okay. on the 15th. Boy, that was fun last year. It was. It, the, what's really neat is the fact that you've got the food plots already planted yeah, to right. come and check them out. When did you plant them? Oh, it's been three, four weeks. We got a little bit late start. Uh, the weather is, it doesn't always cooperate with us. Plus, with our uh, agronomy division, they're very busy in the spring. So we <laughs> kind of got pushed back, and then to get on it was hard because of the wetness. And so we're a little behind, but things are going pretty good. Good. Growing up pretty nice over there. And so, yeah, like, like last year, we uh, opened it up for people to come and see. Um, not only on that day, but after that, um, you can come down anytime and, and see how things progress and how they're growing. And so, I mean, we had people who were coming in November yet to see what stuff was looking like after some of the frost and even the light snow. Can so, I uh, hunt over your food plots? <laughs> <laughs> That well, building is to, nice and tall. I yeah, can sit right have, up there. You can have to stand in line with all the guys that work at agronomy. Uh, and, uh, but uh, we do have a few tracks through there, so yeah. we know. I remember we know. last year I saw them there when yeah. I was there. Yeah, I think we saw something right away when we yeah. were setting up, come squirting through yeah. there. So <laughs> We were there nice and early. We really were, early. and we were talking about that. Uh, it was kind of chilly that morning. It was. And uh, so we had those wonderful pig-in-the-blankets from the, oh, the country store and coffee yeah. and but uh, this great. time we're going to do something. We're going to have a pancake. No, I'm just kidding. Pancake breakfast. I heard you guys last week on that. <laughs> pancake. Yeah, that's Tom. Yeah. <laughs> that's, so, what's, we're having panakuken. Panakuken. <laughs> so we're going to have a pancake <sighs> breakfast. Got to kick things off. And uh, Joe Timmer, our agronomist, will be there to kind of walk walk with you if you'd like. Or you can just wander through. Everything is labeled. And we've got, uh, again, quite a few things planted. And we left the clover from last year to see what a second year looked like we mowed it down and see what it looks like after a, a second year of growth and uh so yeah it's just it's kind of a fun morning and uh, get so when tim gets it. lost in the food plots he'll go and come along and take him by the elbow and pull him through yep mm-hmm. <laughs> yep we can do that for you how so. many different food plots were there uh last year i think we were in the 30s 30 uh, some what about this year we're right close to that again. About same. Yeah, okay. we're going to replant some. We've had a little issue with some things. So we're going out this morning and uh, going to replant stuff. Uh, so we'll get a couple of weeks' growth. Uh, this heat is very hard on, on anything growing. but uh, Especially yeah. no rain. Yeah. yeah. And we sprinkle it continually, but... Uh, Boy, God's good rain is is a whole lot different than sprinklers. Yeah, it's and, way uh, different. So yeah. we're, uh, we're going to redo a few things and uh, get those things going but we've got a lot of good looking stuff out there already what do you so. notice for out of your plots there what's the easiest growing i know it's per area but that does not require a lot of water that you plant it and a lot of that stuff will go yeah that's a tough one um have you had one over the last two years that's just harder than the other ones i uh, our clovers have always done well. Alfalfa's done good. Some of our grasses will grow well. Um, one that's kind of newer on the uh, the list is sun hemp, and uh, that's one that really takes off. It's it's good in the spring for cover 
and then if you plant it a little bit later like this it's good uh, it's good attractant for deer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and some things you really shouldn't be planting till mid-august uh, your brassicas when it's warm during the day cooler at night uh, some of the dwarf essex rape uh, some of your radishes and a lot of those don't get put in until after the wheat comes in normally so i mean it's a fast grow and you can get a foot long on a radish radish uh, no i'm just i have some dis different curiosity so i'm not sure. like rolling right with you <laughs> um what i'm curious about is and uh we've talked about this jamie uh the diet change of the deer mm -hmm. when you put together a food plot do you typically put together a food plot that holds plant life that the deer <clears throat> will crave in august and then come october does something else start to sprout that continues them coming because of a change in their diet that depends on how you want to set it up. Um, there's, you know, ways to do that. Everything is ready at one time, or you can do stripes or circles, or depending on what you plant, you have different things coming up at different times. So it's not something like we can get a time release on the seed, is what I'm curious of. No. Plant it once, leave it undisturbed, draw them in in August without going back there to get them, you know, to replant to get them there in October. Well, yeah, you would do that because you're, some of your things are slower grow. I mean, you're going to okay. plant it all at the same time, but some of them are going to be slower grow. And, and with some of these mixes, you're seeing that where they're, they're adding different things in there so mm -hmm. that, uh, yeah, you're going to have this sprouting later. Mm -hmm. um, your rape seeds, your brassicas, um, they grow and the frost will hit them and take the the sweetness of the leaf the mm -hmm. sugars rest to this but with a radish then the radish or the turnip stay behind and so then you've got the fruit there uh, okay. or if you mix it oats and a winter pea together um, they'll sprout up they'll travel longer through the cold weather so that you've mm -hmm. got something there for mm -hmm. the deer a little bit later so there's a variety of ways to do things now okay. jamie do you still have animals at the Outdoor Discovery Center? Yeah, we do. We have elk, actually. Elk. Okay, mm -hmm. how many you got in there? Uh, I believe nine. We have five cows and four calves. That just The calves are just born in uh, early June. Oh, no bull anymore. No bull. We got rid of the bull. We're getting a new one this fall. Nice, nice. Now, do you guys ever plant food plots for them? Oh, we have planted some. We've done mostly alfalfa. Okay. Uh, we have about a five-and-a-half-acre uh, uh, elk yard, and we have done some areas where we've done some mowing and planting, yeah, to try to, to keep... Uh, uh, good quality grasses out there for them okay excellent excellent so it's always mainly that alfalfa you haven't seen i'm just thinking in a in a you know a captive area where you can see it you haven't ever planted strips or anything we've not ever out. done the strips it's it's hard to to maintain that over okay. a period of time yeah um yeah especially during the season when you might want to be getting in there and when we've had a bull elk in the past and he rams the <laughs> equipment that you're trying to use for planting <laughs> oh, that'd be an experience you better have yeah. a cab <laughs> uh, yeah it's, it's real yeah yeah excellent well i thought yeah maybe that would fit in with seeing the difference on you know do they like this do they not like that you know mm -hmm. kind of neat yeah. Yeah, well that, I, that's all always, i know well, go, go ahead, ahead Terry. i was gonna say that's always interesting because even different areas of michigan have different mm -hmm. draws yeah, know, oh yeah some guys are like wow radish are the only thing they'll touch in my area where yep. another guy says they've left that alone completely for yep. two years i'm not going to put that back in uh whereas some of the newer stuff coming out or some of the older stuff they're trying and finding that attractant to them and then you go 50 miles north they hear and they're leaving that yep. alone so you know and funny so. you say that because i planted i have a muck field behind my house so i planted in our food plots a whole bunch of turnips and sugar beets mm -hmm. and those deer never touched them yep. not a single one now really yeah oh yeah and like up north we plant a lot of uh i don't know if it's sweet peas or winter peas probably a winter pea winter pea i think you're right yeah and of course he's right he knows you don't. he is the food plot <laughs> king <laughs> and uh um but yeah we we planted those up there and they don't really like them but ryegrass just they love it yeah it seems like they come from miles interesting just different areas. It varies from different yeah. areas yep. yeah the outdoor show is brought to you by advantage marine in zealand with competitive prices and personalized service to meet all your needs repair storage winterizing parts and more 
Call Advantage Marine in Zealand at 616-748-9235 or stop in and see Dave at 8755 Riley Street in Zealand. That's at the corner of 88th and Riley on the northeast side of Zealand. Lines are open. Give us a call, 395-1450. We'll be back here shortly on The Outdoor Show. Welcome to the uh, welcome back to the outdoor show. <laughs> Brought to you by MI Firearms ETS. That's Michigan Firearms, educating people in the safe and responsible use of firearms since 2001. It's on your computer, MIFirearmsETS.com. So we had a busy morning so far this oh, morning. Oh yeah, it's been great. We got a report on the uh, Big Red Classic and the uh, Save the Tatas tournament and the money raised for that and where the money's going and what that's being used for and so on. And I want to, you know, apologize to you guys for double booking you. <laughs> I saw the look on your face when Jamie walked in. You're like, oh, no, I forgot. Well, you know. Well, I think you couldn't have two better guys to have in at the same time. I mean, you guys feed off each other. It worked out all right for me. Yeah. So. Split the pay yeah, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> so what's going on with the outdoor? So, I'm noticing something here. The, the grand opening of the new visitor center. Yeah, we have a new visitor center oh, nice. that will be opening up this uh, fall, September. We have, um, it's, a, it's a building that's going to have three main display rooms. It'll have a building, or it'll have a room that's, <clears throat> excuse me, focusing on uh, animal habitats. And so we'll be able to classify, or uh, kind of create, uh, we're working with Jamie Fluelling out of Legends Taxonomy in Ludington. Okay. And he's going to come in and he's going to create some dioramas and displays for us to incorporate all the taxidermy that we have. Oh, that's great. And then we'll have another room that's going to focus on vertebrate animal groups. So, you know, and, and I've gotten in your case about this, Tom, before, you know, horns versus antlers, you know, <laughs> no, uh, no, no, things no, like no, that. No, no. Hey, you got to get after him. <laughs> oh, right. is it oh, yeah, it's all horned. <laughs> Everything's horned. So uh, <laughs> we're going to have uh, an education-based room then for Tim that's, to visit yep, on a weekly basis, yes. you know. Uh, <laughs> weekly, any daily. <laughs> It's funny you say that because we went to the rodeo last night, which, by the, and I'm not going to do a big plug-in for them and stuff, but the Ottawa County Fair, I haven't been there for many years, and, it, and it's it was really good. The rodeo was actually absolutely awesome, and they the guy, he called the antlers on the bull. Oh, jeez, come on, that's coming that that all around. He was doing it for fun. He was doing it for fun. Oh, okay. <laughs> he right. doing it for fun. Oh, okay. They, they had a lot of fun down there with the announcements and so on. It was <laughs> actually good. very enjoyable. Good. And uh, we haven't just haven't been there for years because we haven't had time. You know, yeah. we've been doing, I mean, we're busy. Yeah. We're busy people. Did busy double booking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Double, busy double booking. booking. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. But, okay, so the, the new, the, the visitor center will be kind of like, the building originally the old town hall that's right for doing the education right well actually not quite we're going to keep that township hall is still there it's it's called founders hall and that's going to be maintained as our classroom space there are plenty of times where we have groups Mm -hmm. camps some something going on where we're using that space to teach or or reserve for some activity that we have going on and that eliminates our ability to have visitors just come in we are free and open to the public every day of the week you know outside of major holidays Mm -hmm. and uh so this visitor center building will be the welcome center at the trailhead um it's going to be the place for for all the displays and and opportunities for people to to kind of start their experience that founders hall building will still be used as a classroom space but will not be open to the public because it's going to be you know you know carpet squares on the floor and kind of just ready for the groups to show up yeah yeah i i kind of watched some of the progression that uh, i think the stuff was on the website or yeah something. we've done some some photo stuff on the website yep and i, I kind of you know keep tabs on the odc even though i don't, I don't get there as frequently anymore that's i know right. you miss me that's it, true <laughs> we'll wait to see you back you'll be there at the grand opening well i hope so september 29th yeah. i think is yeah. uh oh i might have a class that night but well, yeah, then you better reschedule yeah. i know we'll, we'll have to try that <laughs> This is, imagine okay. you get double book it. Jamie, I'll be there to support. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> okay, here's all we're going to say about this that's coming up here, what I'm going to say. And and then we're going to stop because he never wants to come in anymore and talk to me. Okay. <laughs> well, you double book him. No, no, no. I'm not, talking about, I'm not talking about Jamie. Jamie comes in to talk to me. <clears throat> Originally, Travis used to talk to me, and Travis was the first employee. He was a, a first, uh, yeah, he was director and first full-time employee. And, and, and handled stuff. And I used to do stuff with Travis, and then Jamie came on the scene and stuff, and then Travis just pushed me off to Jamie. Not that Jamie's not awesome, but Travis just pushed me off. Well, Tom, they come to see me. <laughs> Travis received a certificate of congressional recognition. Awesome. 
So, and you can read more about that online and in the newsletter. Yep. But to get a newsletter, you got to become a member. Do you yeah. receive that newsletter at home, Tom? I don't know that I get it anymore. <laughs> I used to have it. I, I, I think we do have you still on the list. Yeah. I was an honorary. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, we could show Tim the bottom of this page in the newsletter. Oh, there you go. The there you go. Way. Yeah, babies were born at the ODC. He's going to run. He's going to wet himself. Oh <laughs> gosh! <laughs> <laughs> There's snakes on the bottom of that page, and he doesn't like that. No. But I'll tell you, my my kids were always fascinated by the snakes when they went into Founders Hall. Oh yeah. And. Uh, you know, we've talked about it before, but my daughter and her little friend, they found the one snake eating the, the, the toad and <laughs> yeah, the other snake. <laughs> right. And then, and then we had to get them separated and so on. <laughs> it was kind of a neat little adventure for them. They remember it. But now I'm just I'm looking at some of the different stuff. You know, we've talked so much about ODC and, and the growth of ODC and the things that are going on. The ODC is is now um, the ODC and the McIntyre Greenway. The Outdoor Discovery Center McIntyre Greenway is a full organizational name. Yeah. yeah. And it... Uh, the the involvement in our environment around here by the ODC has been phenomenal. I'm sure that's part of the reason that uh, Travis received that uh, congressional Yeah, it's certainly very strong education and conservation message. And all the different programs for the schools and stuff. But in the summertime, I think people forget that there's things going on. And I kind of want to look at um, Creek Stomp is happening on Friday, August 7th. Yep. And... It's kind of neat because I see Explore Nordelos Creek. Mm -hmm. I I should be leading that tour. <laughs> you know, I grew up right there. I had no idea. No. <laughs> <laughs> I've explored everything to do with Nordelos Creek, but now the creeks changed. You know, things things flow differently and stuff. But I think that would be really neat because um, we used to catch lots of crayfish there. Sure, and actually, there's and it is one of those uh, uh, creeks that's that's seeing improvement thanks to th places like Macdonald Green Space. Nice. The old country club. Nice. What's this crayfish that came in that's invasive? Uh, red? red swamp crayfish. Yeah. And I'm as Can far as I'm aware, and it was not identified Can in Lake Makatoa. I don't know. Try it. Let us know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe it's a little peppery or yeah. something. I don't know. Yeah, go for it. Uh, maybe it's Cajun. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's you got stuff happening August seven. Uh, the there's a hunter safety class coming up. We have August twelve, I believe it is. Is that just a field day? Uh, it is just a field day. Yep. Is that yeah. what you guys do now? Yeah, that's the uh, DNR is pushing that pretty hardcore. Yeah. Yeah. To, yeah to, do it online. Do it online and then, and then the go to a field day. day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I just I ignore their phone calls. So <laughs> we just don't do it. <laughs> we do it. We do the full blown class. Yeah. There's a lot of kids and parents that really want that full-blown Oh, yeah, class, sure, you know? sure. But I understand what the DNR is trying to push, and I understand the pressure to do that, but I also understand the time commitment for the ODC to just do the field day. And I think yeah. um, I think Doug sends me stuff when he's doing it mm -hmm. so that I know, to let people know, yeah, go over there if you can't right. make yeah, it to I, what we're I doing. You know? right. yeah. uh, I, I'm looking at the newsletter, and there are so, much, so many – awesome things of the ODC. you got to get there, and you can go to Outdoor, Dis Outdoor Discovery Center org. Yep. Outdoor Discovery Center org. you got to get on your computer. Check that out. There's so many activities, and, and many people think, oh, it's for the little kids. Not no, all. it's not, not just all. for the little kids. The big kids like it, They too. have elk. That's right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and snakes. <laughs> that was the first thing that attracted me to the place is when I found out there was an elk over there, yep. I went over there. Well, that's what And then I met Travis, and then yep. things went from there. We started taking cadets there and stuff sure. like that, and it was just, it was really awesome. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I wish we had more time, but somebody over double booked. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get there August 15th for the Food Plot Field Day, 64th, and... Uh, Byron Road, right behind the recent country store at the agronomy location. Thank you, Terry, for coming in and telling us about the food plots. We appreciate it very much, and hopefully we can get some more stuff going for the fall for people to know what to do that we can get you back in. Jamie, thank you for coming in to talk about the Outdoor Discovery Center and the things that happen there. Uh, I hope we can get you again soon Sounds to great. talk about more of the, the activities going on and the stuff that's happening. And listeners, we appreciate your participation this week, and we'll talk to you again next week right here on the Outdoor Show.